So I'll be covering this huge topic in three main headings, that is prevalence of PGI, diagnosis, and criteria of diagnosis and investigations to be done, and how do we manage. Because we must all understand this very carefully, because we are going to see more and more number of cases in near future. A recent search on uh, PubMed resulted in more than 4,622 publications on PGI, and you can see this graph is increasing rapidly up, and hence we must not ignore understanding this problem. The prosthetic joint infection, that is PGI, has been defined on several occasions by many leading organizations and individuals. First in 2011, uh, Musculoskeletal Infection Society defined this under various criteria. Amongst all the classification, two things are most important and universally accepted to prove as an infection. One is presence of a discharging sinus and presence of microorganism or demonstration of microorganisms either by knee aspirate or culture from the sinus is positive, then you, can, you declare is at PGI, but unfortunately, such scenario is not always available. We have only painful knee with some swelling, sometime without swelling, and considering as PGI, and then we have to rely on several other supportive uh, investigations as mentioned here. Then in 2018, uh, the classification, another classification of, uh, by Pervezi came, uh, which is accepted is still, again, uh, several criteria were used, and the two most important, two positive cultures of the same organism, presence of sinus tract, which is communicating to the joint. If you have other parameters, positive like elevated C CRP, D-dimer, ESR, synovial fluid in the uh, WBC, elevated synovial WBC count in the fluid, and so on, you give different score, and then you come to a diagnosis of PGI. The case which was discussed previously, uh, I do not know how many of these were considered uh, to consider as PGI. Recently, European Committee of uh, Bone and Joint Infection defined uh, different criteria where they included so many things, hence it was not uh, supported by 68% of the surgeon uh, who studied this uh, classification. So we, we are still not sure which classification to follow, and there are several methods or ways by which one can diagnose PGI. Uh, we have serum and plasma markers. The basics are ESR, CRP, WBC count, uh, procalcitonin, D-dimer, fibrinogen levels, and IL-6 especially are proving to be of some value, but not 100% sure. Sign Aspiration of a joint in, uh, in a suspected case of PGI is very, very crucial, and one must do not only cytology of the fluid, but also uh, check for alpha defensive, and good microbiology backup is required. The way you also collect the fluid from the joint is crucial because you should not send it in a routine culture while uh, that too uh, reaching in the lab for after some hours. Instead, better to take this fluid in aerobic and anaerobic uh, culture bottles directly so that yield of the bacteria is increased. Then serum biomarkers uh, are of some uh, value because they have some sensitivity and specificity. Uh, the CRP is, of course, more sensitive uh, and specific than ESR and interleukin-6, which is produced by monocytes and macrophages, uh, is proving to be uh, much more reliable because it becomes normal normally after 48 hours of the surgery. Uh, as you can see on this uh, uh, chart, that uh, there are several synovial fluid bio biomarkers that has uh, been studied where alpha defensin has the highest diagnostic odd ratio and uh, is much more specific uh, than the others. Radiology does help. Plain radiographs, of course, are a must to prove uh, or disprove if there is any lucency suggesting of infection. But recently, uh, 
magnetic resonance imaging where you can suppress the metallic image by special scans like Maverick scan uh, can show you presence of fluid around the prosthesis suggesting of infection. And this is usually available in most MRI machines in good centers. Nuclear imaging, which used to be very popular, has been found to be very non-specific and non-sensitive in diagnosing infection, and one must not rely in one or the other type of uh, nuclear imaging technique only for the diagnosis. Histology, as has been mentioned, is very uh, uh, useful in patients of suspected uh, PGI, and one must do, in all cases, histology, not only to exclude uh, atypical infections, but if you have more than five uh, uh, polymorphs per nuclear field, then chances of uh, declaring it as infection are quite positive. The next generation uh, uh, sequencing techniques are coming uh, where you can actually uh, do not rely on culture growth, but you can diagnose by their genetic uh, sequencing uh, the presence or absence of uh, those bacteria. As Dr. Malota recently uh, just now told, BioFire can, is a simple technique which, is, which gives you result in one or two days, can detect the most common bacteria, and uh, like in our hospital, we detect these bacteria which are commonly, but if you have atypical bacteria which are not covered in BioFire, you cannot declare it as PGI. Another problem with BioFire is that you can declare it as a PGI, but you don't, do not know which microorganism is there and what is the sens antibiotic sensitivity for it. So there are diagnostic algorithms available, and the best one which I could find in the literature is this one. You, if you have a sinus tract, uh, then the diagnosis of PGI is almost sure. If you don't have, then you have to do the other tests like serum markers, uh, and uh, synovial fluid markers, and uh, once uh, you can also do intraoperative uh, test findings in the form of histology, uh, synovial fluid culture, etc. So diagnosis of PGI is very, very difficult and challenging, as has been mentioned before. Almost 50 percent of the suspected PGI do not yield microorganism in routine labs, and that leads to not only challenges to the surgeon to how to treat, but also it becomes medical legally important uh, to save yourself if you are planning for uh, major surgery, as happens in this case. If you have proven PGI, then there are various techniques that we know can be done. In acute infections, one can do a dire procedure where you, die, where you retain the implant, debride the joint, but you must remove the plastic and exchange it with a new plastic by cleaning the posterior part of the joint as well. Two-stage revision is still the gold standard in all cases, and one must be, uh, and it should be done very thoroughly. In stage one, you do major debridement, remove the capsule, uh, uh, debride the capsule, take adequate samples from at least five places and uh, lavage the joint and put a dy dynamic or static antibiotic loaded spacer depending on the culture sensitivity. In stage two, you uh, revise the joint under the cover of antibiotics. Normally, I give antibiotics for until the wound has healed, that is about two weeks. There are various variables that are, can, are associated in this type of surgery, like type of spacer, type of antibiotics, length of antibiotics, the period between the resection and the reimplantation. The, there are several rules preoperative. We all know about it. I need not to go. Spacer, whether you should use static or articulating, there is no real difference between these two in uh, terms of uh, recurrence of infection or clinical outcomes. Antibiotic cement must be used in these cases, but most of us actually use homeopathic dose of antibiotics in our uh, mixing, you can see that at least in one gram, three gram of vancomycin and four gram of tobramycin has been suggested. Four gram of tobramycin means we get 80 milligram of vial. You can imagine how many. So better to use a pre-mixed uh, 
antibiotic cement if it is available. Duration, usually six weeks, and once you do uh, uh, plan the second surgery, give a two weeks holiday and then repeat your ESR, CRP. Don't jump in straight away after uh, stopping the antibiotics. Because recurrence of infection is high if you do within two weeks of reimplantation, and it is low if you wait for two weeks, but do not wait for a long time because reimplantation after six to weeks, eight weeks is associated with higher incidence of infection. So stage two, I have already told, the infection eradication of stage two overall is around 85% in reported series. Stage one surgery is becoming popular uh, because of simplicity where you, have, you can do uh, debridement and reimplantation in uh, in one go, but you must have an identifiable bacteria which is sensitive to antibiotics, where uh, which you can use during uh, one stage surgery. So treatment algorithm uh, suggests that in acute PGI, <coughs> one can save the joint by debriding, if, especially if you have good bones, stable prosthesis, and no. Uh, bacteria which are difficult to treat. But in chronic P PGI, a prosthesis exchange is a must, and it, it should be done in two stages. Only in one stage, if uh, the bacteria are of low vir virulence and are known, and you have available antibiotics and good bone stock. Thank you very much. Just a small announcement. Uh, Dr. Raju Vesh has actually all this talk and a ready reckoner. He's given us this as a booklet which will be distributed tomorrow for everyone. The, about everything about infections as a small handout which you can just keep it on your table as well. Thank you, Dr. Raju Vesh, for this sweet gesture for us. Now I invite Dr. Manoj Vadva to come up for his talk on augmented realities in PKR. Thanks, Ramnik, for calling me through. So good evening, gentlemen. Now, talking of augmented reality, just like we have different variables and shoes for different occasions, we need to have different technologies. Depending on what is the kind of ecosystem you run through, what is the kind of patient you're going to deal with, what is the kind of deformity. So running the three through, I know there have been a talk on multiple robotics. I'm drifting the thing through the other technologies, which is augmented reality in future mixed up with AI as well as mixed reality. So it's a new technology and new extension to this armamentarium of emerging technologies. So like for majority of us who run, say, four OTs at a single go and have volume of patients, what we require as a parameter is we require technologies for accuracy, but we don't require heavy footprints into the OR. Talking more of reusable instrumentation, a good deal of clinical evidence, we also like to look in for efficacy as well as the cost saving reduce invasiveness when we are deciding for technologies. We all have involved on different frontiers in arthroplasty, from our conventional traditional jigs, going on to the computer-based surgery, to PSIs, to robotics, and now these new renovs of augmented realities as solution. So what we require is a changing frame of mind, increasing patient expectations, and when I'm talking about augmented reality, many times we speak through, we need to be understanding there are three different terms in this, augmented reality, virtual reality, and a mixed reality, and all three things are different. In augmented reality, you see numerical stuff in a real environment in front of your eyes, it's an imageless solution. Virtual reality is like virtual things in a virtual environment, more for teaching tools, you want to tell a patient how your knee gets damaged and what you do in that. And mixed reality is where you see image-based solutions in front of a real environment. So in augmented reality, you have a displayed information, just like a halo Nex or heads-up display in a car. You see in a car, you have the speedometers and things going in front of you. That's what it is. The controls are purely with you during your surgeries. And mixed reality, you see 3D virtual objects appear in a real environment. So in augmented reality, you have these smart glasses, which have a camera and which have a projection going in front of your eyes. It's a virtual screen. When a surgeon is operating, you see all your markers and degrees and various and flexion deformities and the numbers going in front of your eyes. 
It has reusable instrumentations. You have these kind of markers going through. So it's in between, uh, I would say, the conventional surgeries, which require rods and thromboembolism points we used to be speaking on, to the, I think, once downside I always feel with the robotics and computer-based surgeries, the use of those pins and necessarily scars going in your body. It's without those pins and scars. So these are the core technologies. There is a quick comparison on uh, the frontiers and technologies we all move through. So what we always look in is any technology that gives you zero footprint is image-less, does not require a lot of uh, disposable stuff. It's cost efficient. It gives you what you require from your patient, and it's affordable. So. In augmented reality, you have these glasses, you have these well, instrumentation that there, they are uh, sort of QR coded. So every time you have to use a tracker, you put up these glasses before you scrub up, you adjust and fit those glasses so that like in anything, you have a variable and numbers going very clear in your eyes so that you don't have an obstruction in this field, whereas the surgical field is also there. So just by the movement of your chin and the head, you can control all movements. You don't require anybody across else on the table. Whether you want to control with pointer, with a clamp, you want to operate on the left or the right side, you want to do the femur first or the tibia first, or any customized solution that you want through. So any protocol that you want, any side that you want, you have to mark it with your legs. These are the markers that are there. The first marker, just like in any navigation or robotic, we have to identify the hip center. You put up a marker into the case where you have the PCL attachment, you identify 10 static points. This is more like a stereotactic surgery. You have two markers, one to the center of the trochlea, the other one fixed across the table. And like a stereotactic neurosurgery, you have the frames going through. So with these jigs, you can mark up your degrees of various inflection that you want to inculcate through. Once you identify it with that, there are different stylus for the femur and the tibia. You identify the depth. You see with these two trackers and markers that your intended varus and flexion extension, whatever you want to fix it on that patient, is there. So once this is done, you make your cut and you can always validate your cuts. So this is the distal femur. You have made your cut. You will put the tracker and the markers back in. And you validate what is your remaining values. Once validation is done for the femur, you get on to the proximal tibia the same way. Put it in the contular region. Similarly, mark your lateral malleolus, medial malleolus. Identify the axis between the proximal and distal part of the tibia, the mechanical axis. Once the axis is identified, then comes the navigation step. You put up the proximal tibia cutting jig. You work on the kind of posterior slope and the various valgus you need for your patient. Again, a stylus on the amount of flexion you need from the medial or the lateral side. Once the basic steps are fixed, you remove these parts, and like a normal surgery, you make your proximal tibial cut. So once your angles, your slope, your various valgus is fixed, you make your proximal tibial cut. And once this cut is done, you're going to validate your proximal tibia. So this is the way you validate your distal femur and proximal tibia, and thereon you get back to your commercial instrumentation. So a lot of innovations are happening through as an add-on to these technologies, where uh, just like you in a robotic, you do your uh, CT, framework and you do measure all your sizes and all those things you capture that information from the ct you amalgamate that on your augmented reality and as a mixture your surgeries are way more comprehensive more precise and in uh, a lot of studies they are more time efficient as compared to robotics and less complex so ar it today is a technology that overlays digital information objects into the real world environment it's a partially immersive technology and focuses on visualization of real-world surgical parts. Now, a lot of these AR technologies are getting amalgamated in the next studies to the mixed reality augmentation, where just like I am operating on a knee, and out there, 
I want to see how my posterior fragment moves on. You can move on and you see the superimposition of your images onto a real life environment. You want to see how this knee, just like in a CT surgery, you were saying, Mahesh was saying in the morning, you were flipping around your knee and to see how it looks like in flexion and an extension in the sizing on the restoring the posterior condylar offset. You can make all these measurements on this. And marked up with MRI, so your MRI with a mixed reality is the next platform. They have done those surgeries on shoulders, just like you're in a reverse shoulder. The biggest problem is where you put up your screw, the central screw into a glenoid. Same way, on a normal glenoid, you will have a superimposition of these images and you shoot in your screw. So these are the new kind of innovations coming in. Where your technology is there with you, but it is becoming lesser complex and easy to use in other things. And along with that is coming the platforms of artificial intelligence amalgamated with these things, where you have different algorithms and a lot of data being fed in with these MRIs and other technologies to aid you onto the tracking. So it gives you real-time feedback during surgeries to surgeons to achieve precise implant placement and alignment. So new technologies, AR mixed with MR with your CT-based information with your AI is going to be the next step. So in comprehension, augmented reality is universal. The one biggest beauty is you're not bound by that company equipment to be used. You use your technology for your cuts and then whatever industry implants you want to use and you're comfortable with, you can use those. It's compact and simple. Uh, simple learning curve, zero footprints into the OR, no disposables are required, reusable instrumentation, and as with the surgeries, no percutaneous pins or no intramedullary rods are required. So these are the newer modalities as you show through the mixed reality platforms. That is the next innovation being amalgamated with these things. And thank you so much, Vaishan District. Thank you so much. Everybody stay in. Hold your nerves. I invite Dr. Gurwa Reddy and Dr. Hemant Vakankar to come up on the stage. When we thought of Dr. Hemant Vakankar, I will manage you, don't worry. So when we thought of it, we thought we want something, somebody to give us a balanced view of so many things coming in, robotics or no, no, no robotics. If robotics, why robotics? And I think probably Dr. Gurwa Reddy is the best person or with Dr. Hemant Vakankar to go through it because they've seen both sides of the thing. They're enjoying their world now. They've already enjoyed what they did earlier. So to join them on stage, we have Dr. Mahesh Kulkarni. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar for some reason isn't here. So for do instead of Dr. Rajkumar, I'll, I'll get a balanced approach on the dais. Dr. Gurinder Vedi, I'm getting you on for the balanced approach. Dr. Vikram Jain, Dr. Shekhar Srivastav, Dr. Anup Jurani, and Dr. Vivek Logani. Sir, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear us? Is the mic on? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It is going to be fun because we don't know what we are going to do. <laughs> okay, the fun starts from there. No, but uh, I'm sure since morning uh, we have been doing because the whole conclave is in a smart conclave. Uh, trends in arthroplasty, there is a heading. So definitely we cannot close our eyes for the technology and Manoj has given a wonderful talk on the augmented reality. So. For an average orthopedic surgeon, we wanted to make some of the points clear, as we said. Uh, number one, I'll ask some questions, and Hemant will ask some questions, and we will give some comments as well. I'll start with uh, Gurinder. All these things, now people say that it is very costly, and uh, it's not affordable, and all that stuff. If I give you a free robot, will you take it? Oh, yes, uh, al almost certainly. I mean, I think there's uh, th there's definite amount of leeway which you which you get both for the both for the quality the reproduction of of your results the um, the accuracy of of what you do so uh, hardly can think of any reason why i won't take it at all okay so you will say that robot is definitely going to add value to your practice that's right so let us ask the questions to the general audience how many people if you can afford let us say it is like a c arm how many people want to take the robot lift the hands 
how many of you want it because it will add value to your practice or it will help your practice get more patients by marketing? So let, let, let us rephrase the question. Yeah, yeah, both is there again. Let us rephrase the question. How many people are genuinely think that it is going to add pure value to your practice? Forget about the marketing, we'll ask that one. Majority? Majority, okay. Now, second question, how many people have changed your skeptic views to neutral or positive to the robotics? Okay. Yeah, okay. Less, okay. Less. less than, okay, yeah. Let us the last question for the audience. How many people do not want a robot at all and how many people want to go with Bharat Modi? Come what may. Come what may. <laughs> <laughs> no. Don't yeah. abuse him just because, because he's not okay. here. Okay. Because, <laughs> Anu, because Bharat is not here. If Bharat was here, many people would probably say that. <laughs> yeah. Scared of Bharat. <laughs> right. Um, Vivek, you got a QVIS, right? No, I do navigation in every single case. Okay, right. Yeah. Then let us go to the navigation and robotics. Which, uh, I wish Arun Mulaji is here. Uh, right. Uh, what is the advantage of robotic versus navigation or you feel that navigation is good enough? Yeah, I've been using it since 2009 and uh, it's good enough and I think I do not need a robotic hand for the execution aspect because the technology aspect is already there with navigation and I've been able to put it to best use by doing it in every single case. Um, Yes, I would definitely want a robot if at least 20% of my uh, cases are hips and if at least 5 to 10% are uni. That would add value to, to get a robot over and above navigation. I can see Anup moving his head like this. I can make out whether he agrees or disagrees. <laughs> I, I disagree. Counter, what does the robotics got extra than navigation? Yeah, there's this sagittal plane, the depth of the cut. Because when you cut with a saw, suppose you cut you planned a 9, you cut a 10, you can't do anything about it except check. In the sagittal plane regarding the flexion extension of the femur, you planned a 3, you cut a 5, you can't do anything about it. So it's the execution, especially on the sagittal plane, which is very important, the depth of the cut, which is very important. Navigation, you can cut and check. Robotic, you can do exactly what you planned. So there's a there's a load of difference between the two two instrumentations. Yeah, so the, the, the one I point think just yeah, we all I think it's just a matter of practice of how you do and whether you have to check and recheck. With practice, uh, your execution is almost always perfect. No, but yes, no, he, I agree with him that the, you tend to skive, but when you are vigilant enough. Whether or not you are skiving, you are, you are vigilant while you are doing it uh, no, on the Robotics table. is probably preventing you from even doing I those think, errors. I think even for, even for that reason, it is not worthwhile from navigation to robotics. So so that, that does not give me Rosa, enough reason Rosa to, actually to move from navigation to robotics. Rosa, as, as, you know, in that any? respect, is leaving all the Have errors of any? Uh, saw usage uh, in its place. Sorry? Rosa, yeah. by its yeah, you know, it just definition, robotic. Robotic, is yeah. leaving all the errors of the uh, you know, using of saw. You know, doesn't uh, change that at all. So execution is not there. So would you call Rosa a robot or not is the question? I would not. There are only two, uh, two true robots. One is Mako and other is QS. Cori and uh, Wellis, again, those passive systems have certain drawbacks. We can discuss that yeah, later in yeah. space. So but let us get the one point is clear. The lot of debate keeps on going. People are staunch supporters of robot navigation. They say that we don't need robotics. But robotics, the one single advantage, as Anup alluded, is the ability to check and recheck, plan and replan without cutting. And as I showed in my lecture, when you're dealing with the gross deformities, that is very handy. Whatever the experience you have, Vivek, definitely that is one step more than the navigation. Now let us go to, uh, I forgot, uh, Vikram. Vikram. Vikram, yeah. Vikram, you use robot? Yeah. What is the robot you use? Rosa. Rosa. Yeah. Right, I think uh, Hemant already alluded to that. Of course, we don't have any shares either in Striker or no, any other we company. We don't have any shares in any company. But we so will be very candid here. Um, yeah. I feel Rosa is uh, a glorified navigation or whatever it is. It just puts the jig there, doesn't do anything more than that. What when, is your thought uh, process on that? When I started, uh, I, was, I was doing like everybody else as a mechanical surgeon. 
But what allowed Rosa and over the last six months have done for 500 cases allowed me to shift to kinematics. I'm a big fan of kinematics. And I think Rosa allows me to do kinematics as this balancing tool, which is real time happening. You know, you can recheck, recheck, recheck. So the chances of error are much less, which is a fantastic tool. Uh, I've tried other systems. It gives the surgeon that real feel of actually using the saw and you know taking everything in your control. So I think the surgeon feeling stays. To my mind, it is a less complicated system. The figures that I see oh, with Mako, uh, obviously when you've done about you know 100, 200 cases, uh, everything looks easy. For a starter surgeon, that's too much information happening on the screen. Rosa is a much simpler system, and it allows me to adopt that technology very well to a point that now. My juniors now say that I do not know how to do a regular surgery because it's such easy. The time to execution is actually like a mechanical instrument. Yeah, let us go down to the front benchers. Manoj, you are Raj Kapoor of orthopedics, <laughs> arthroplasty, and your numbers are humongous. Why you are resisting to a robot? It will pull him down. Yeah. Don't tell me finances. Ready, you can buy 100 <laughs> robots. Okay. Not for the finances, Akurva. I tried multiple times and uh, I don't want to beat down anybody's views in my hands. I do not think it gives me a much amount of a difference. I tried in a couple of surgeries. I went overseas also with the masters to look in. Just for one thing, I do things through the heart. If, it does, if I don't get convinced, I don't get convinced. That's the only point I can tell you. With that, I respect everybody who does. No, it's okay. Music. Respect, disrespect, let us not bother. But, but <laughs> so in, you are married to augmented world, reality. In, see, in you the say augmented world, reality, I, but I moved to four OTs. I cannot, and then it is a bilateral case. In this particular system, I can use on one right side, and then how do I move on the left side? Then how do I ruin the next three OTs? In a real life picture, for me, it does not make sense. Okay, so augmented reality, you feel the way forward than robotics? So augmented reality is an evolving part. It's not it has reached there. If you ask me today, we are trying to amalgamate and see whatever information, uh, like Mahesh, I was very happy with the information you had achieved from your CT on your surgery. If with that surgery and my experience with the background, I know what sizes, I know what slope, what angles, where I have to position my epicondyles, where it has to get on, and I have this technology to help me on and mix the information out of two things, I think I can achieve 95 or 99 percent of the same information. Right. Let us go to the All India Institute. Uh, Premier Institute, all VIPs, ministers, chief, uh, prime ministers are there, your patients. What is that, Vijay? Yeah. Why are you not asking a robot for your insurance? <laughs> see, uh, uh, I think from my institute point of view, see, being a government institute, the only thing is, suppose a robot comes with an open platform. I think we'll be the first one to buy. Okay. You know, so it's married to an implant. Right, got it. You know, so, you know. Can you switch it, off let those lights, open, please? Yeah. Let yeah. me be open system. You just, just have a robot, maybe like a navigation, you, and you can use any implant with it. You know, I think that is one thing that we are looking for. Yeah, it's a valid point. I think you all know that open system, closed system, because most of the robots are closed. So suppose if you want to do macro, you have to do only striker, like that. But the, what Vijay Kumar is saying, if it is an open platform, he will have flexibility of doing uh, uh, different types of company uh, ro uh, instruments. But do right. you use do you use multiple type of implants in your system? Yeah, yeah, you? yeah, multiple. So our list has <laughs> means all four. You know, at least. Uh, it means what four or five different types of company, every list. No, but that's by virtue of choice or by that's by virtue of some other No, it's virtue of choice also, it's virtue of uh, availability also and a lot of other things. Yeah. Yeah, let us go to yeah. Apollo. Raju. Right, what are your thought process on robots? I think you, you got a Maco, right? Yeah. Recently acquired, yeah. Correct. Right, so. I think. Uh, uh, we don't have a large experience, but I have a large experience of conventional uh, TKR. Uh, the differences which I have found using Mako is that it resects much lesser bone. It uh, surgical releases are much less. The placement of implant is highly accurate, and the size of sizing of implant is very good. And you are very confident that you can now mobilize the patient very first day with e even without support. Uh, so there is no ifs and buts. And I found that robo is even much better than for hip replacement surgery where chances of inaccuracy are much higher. 
uh, and you totally avoid uh, uh, human uh, errors in that. Yeah, g g on that point, because let me t uh, tell that we have done more than 5,000 uh, macros so far. If you ask me with gun on my head, I would say robot is a must for partial knee and total hip. We, to total knee we can do without robot, it's not a f problem. Total hips, people have done it for ages, but the 24 parameters or variables are all addressed by one single macro screenshot. That is one of the best. How far you can bang the cup also, it's in single reaming. You see them, I, I got married to macro after seeing the hip in Australia. Until yeah, that same, time, same, I same with our experience. Same with uh, Kaman and Mahesh. We were resisting using uh, robotics for a long time. came down to Hyderabad, time. saw it, got back and to this one. Partial knee and hip were the most impressive. Knee is, yeah, obviously it's a uh, evolution from, uh, you know, navigation to robotics. Yeah. Anup. I think 90% of our cases are primary knees. And we got to do them better than what we've no, been doing. No, doubt about that. And that is where actually robotics help us, in my, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. So there are a number of steps of the operation that you can really manipulate. Sure. And, and get to near, near perfection levels. Yeah. So. Shekhar. You got a QS. I think uh, for the uninitiated, there are again three types of robots. One is fully automated. Second is a semi-automated or semi uh, this Active. thing. And third is a completely passive. And MACO is a semi-automated. That means uh, as Monix shown, within the haptic boundaries, it won't let me cut the ligaments even if the patient is my mother-in-law. But this QS is a completely automated. I got both the robots and I think uh, uh, Shekhar will give insights. Shekhar, I'm a bit skeptical until last month about the automated robots. Uh, I thought uh, I'm, I'm not very, I'm concerned. What are the thought process? Uh, regarding and the how, uh, why you opted for automated robots? Regarding the safety? Yeah, safety. Okay. Uh, so we have done around 500 cases till now. And uh, I can assure that it works exactly within the boundaries which you have created. So it's like Miko, it's a city-based robo. So automatically the software creates a boundary within which it will work. But at the same time, you can move those boundaries. Like we are concerned about the structures in the posterolateral part of the knee joint. So uh, what we do, especially when you are doing tibia, uh, you can just move those boundaries a bit anteriorly if you are a bit concerned. But Initially, we used to do that, but then we have seen that the safety profile is so good that now we just stick to the exact boundary and it doesn't go beyond it. So till now, we didn't have any single uh, instance of damage to any soft tissue structures uh, for that. Now, the literature says mm -hmm. that the soft tissue damage is, has been seen only in active robots. But those are for those robots which were of previous generation, yeah. not with the present generation. Yeah, I agree with so you. When Raj Shekhar and myself went for a debate once in a lo long time, three years back, Raj Shekhar kept on arguing that uh, robots can create a lot of uh, damage to the structures, which is a load of rubbish. That is a first generation robot. It's a completely automated. Uh, so Shekhar was not telling the truth. In fact, Shekhar loves to have a cup of coffee every 15 minutes in the operating theater. So he just switches on this <laughs> robot and goes and have a cup of coffee. Am I right? <laughs> no. uh, Guruva, th that's yeah. a misconception yeah. that we should not percolate. I think you got to be there all the time. No, yes. Learn and vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but but, no, but, but Anup, no, no. the fact, <laughs> fact, fact of the matter is that surgeon cannot do anything whatever uh, while the robot is cutting. Minutes, that's that essentially minutes, what he means. That's what I'm saying. That yeah. surgeon the Q is can, automated robot. You just program it and that will cut. It won't let you do anything. So, so while you're, you're cutting it, even if you want to stop it, I yeah. suppose you have a dead switch uh, to you know, shut the system for whatever reasons. But yeah. otherwise, it's going to cut on its own and you're no, just no, watching it. No, you can it. stop it anytime you want. Yeah. No, no, no you can stop it I mean and restart. What I'm uh, saying is you that eight or ten minutes, you don't do anything. That's He's right. not going out. I'm tell not telling you that. Okay. <laughs> right. I have a concern. Ma Mahesh. 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 Yeah. So, I can, yeah. so uh, one technical thing which I always look for is that... Uh, like when the burr starts cutting, you can see it on the screen also that it's making yeah. its mark. Yeah. So I always look for the first point where it touches the bone. If it is matching with the screen thing, that I'm absolutely sure that okay. it's fine. Yes. Yeah. Mahesh, 
Yeah. I'm, you know, I, you are a hip surgeon, and as we are talking, uh, hip, what is the value it brings to the table? Um, as, as all of you have said, uh, hip was one which actually opened my eyes. I was a biggest skeptic of robotics. I would have sat So is this guy. Yeah, yeah. I would have sat with Bharat Modi and happily yeah. uh, cheered for the other team. Yeah. But after watching a hip using Mako system, I think it opened my eyes. It answers most of the questions a hip surgeon would like to answer. You want to uh, get the hip uh, in a perfect alignment. Like we are talking about alignment in knee replacement, there is also functional cup positioning for the hip. Every individual spinopelvic relationship is different. We're going to talk about it tomorrow morning. So you can actually dial the cup for that patient's uh, anatomy and that will prevent hip dislocations. And Levinix safe zone, which has been really been used for the last 35 years, is now nearly dying. So we are getting new concepts where the hip should be positioned, a single ream, um, and it is near perfect. So I Again, think leg length, offset, version, inclination, getting the hip in the right position, tailoring it to the patient's demands is all that you cannot achieve with any other. Again, in um, dysplastic system. hips, you yeah. know where exactly the good bone is and you can put that one there. Right, let me go back to uh, Gurinder. Uh, is there any in between the robotics and the present technology, anything which you think of, like augmented reality or less expensive, but is going to add value to that? I think the only thing that comes to mind really is navigation, but that's been around for a long time. I don't think there's anything that bridges it in between. So it's got to be, I mean, in, in, for all practical purposes, I think the robotic is going to be the jump. And I can't see anything in between that that'll, that's going to replace it presently. L let me uh, ask one question where this all, I think all that debate, especially in the Western world, started with that value of 20% patient dissatisfaction. Do you as surgeons, I mean, surgeons will never believe that, but do you as, you know, if you want to take a, a realistic uh, view of the situation with your patients, what do you think is the realistic patient dissatisfaction rate in your own practice? I mean, I, you can always say that, oh, my patients are never unhappy, but I'm sure they are. So what, what do you think is the what realistic is, what is the value? percentage? So, so, so oh. Hema, yeah, Hema, so dissatisfied patients is one thing and patients having late instability patterns which the patient may not understand or stiffness which the patient may not understand but you need to evaluate. No, no, so no, 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 no. That, that, that is different. Yeah. Everything is so looks good but the patient is not happy. Yeah, that, so that sort of thing. It was, it was anywhere with around 10-12%. Not more than 10% I would and say. And it, it will decrease. It is decreasing with the use of technology because you are cutting the exact amount of bone, getting the right alignment, not touching mm -hmm. the soft tissues. So I'm sure the results are going to get better. And but also I want to add to that. Are we only looking at the unsatisfied patients or are we looking at improving the functional scores and marching towards forgotten joint scores? Bo definitely. Right. Forgotten so joint scores is the end of the objective. You may not have an unsatisfied patient in yeah. uh, more than 5%, but they don't feel the knee is right. So yeah. by allowing, getting the alignment right, whether we will move towards that goal, of making that patient's knee feel much normal. Yeah. So if, you think, if you talk about patient reported outcomes, I mean, yeah, sure. proms. proms, you know, so what do you think realistically would be the figure in your own practice? Let's, uh, you know, just quote a figure. What do you think? Five to 10 percent, myself. I think about uh, 10 percent patients will always remain unhappy no matter what you do, no matter how good a joint is there. And it is because uh, despite all the advances in technology, despite all the finesse that we give to our surgeries, there are a host of other factors which determine the patient uh, satisfaction and obviously it translates into patient reported outcomes. So yes, we must strive our level best for whatever we can do mechanically and surgically and uh, avoid all patient expectation outcome uh, mismatches. Yeah, so the forgotten joint score target should be around 90. Currently it's uh, hovering around 80. So the FJS should go to 90s. That's, that's why. And the high flexion knee score should also improve significantly to 40, 45. Vikram, what is your percentage? Around 10% like 10%. everybody. But then a lot of these patients improve over a period of time. Yeah. But then you don't know. They stop. They might be stopped coming to you and going somewhere yeah, else. Uh, one pertinent point for the youngsters is uh, the, un the un unsatisfied patients mostly depend on your work communication skills with the patient again because the western population they are the demands are more they want to ski they want to have sex next week not these cases in india 
But the way you explain to the patient, a lot of people have got this 100% guarantee syndrome in India. Yes, patient dissatisfaction yeah. is a mismatch between you know what what you what yeah. picture you have painted. So I you, I developed a mechanism in my OPD, which I'm sharing with you. Uh, they will say 100% guarantee. I they I'll say immediately 100% guarantee can be given only by two guys. One is God, another one is fraud. I am neither. So that's it. The, the, you got to walk, you you got to water down the expectations. Otherwise, they will be after you. So now let us go to the next one. Uh, partial knee. What is the percentage of practice of partial knees, uh, Anup, in your practice? Uh, it's roughly about seven eight percent. Partial knees, yeah. Yes, sir. Around seven percent. Anybody more than that? No. We'll be doing about fifteen fifteen to eighteen. Fifteen percent. Uh, on this side. Less. Uh, Hyman? Less. Than five. Less. Anybody, Ramik? What is? Less than five. Um, from our, our American, American colleague, any partial needs? No? No. What about Two Manoj? Vijay? Rajiv? No. Ten percent. See, in terms of absolute numbers, they say that you should be doing minimum 40 unis per year. Yeah, but and if you are doing 100, 15 is total. Yeah, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, percentage. So. Right, again, one point for the youngsters is. If you are going to be an orthoplasty surgeon, you should learn how to do a partial knee full stop. Robot, no robot, but don't bother. But partial knee has got a value, tremendous value, in a selective set of patients. You cannot deny that. You cannot be half-baked orthoplasty surgeon. If you want to practice knee orthoplasty, you should learn partial knee full stop. Sir, can somebody give a mic to you? Anup Jurani. Anup Jurani. He, what is the need of total hip converted by one uh, partial hip? Partial knee. Uh, I didn't and understand. What is that? Total hip? Total knee has been converted into uh, once you have done partial knee, one-sided knee, after how many years you need Total knee. Oh, you mean to say how many years partial, partial knee last? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, no. No, so the partial knee may actually last a lifetime. It's not a, it's not a stop gap operation. It okay. may last pretty long. I do and if you need to you convert it, it for then it's easy to revise. You so do that again uh, can be contested, but anyway, that, that's a separate debate altogether. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> But yes, I mean, Some 15 patients, years is, what, what do you tell your patients, years, how yeah. long will it last? Patient comes and asks you. Young patient, 50 year old. Oh, 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Uh, then, a well done partial knee. Yeah. Again. Then, then you can convert it to a total knee. Okay. Sir, I will answer in a simple way. I would do what I would do in my OPD. Uh, there are two cohorts of patients for partial knee. If the patient is 40 years, 45 years, all the other things are completely exhausted, no respite. I'll tell him, look, my friend, you will need two surgeries in your lifetime. I'd rather do partial knee now and convert into an easier transition to total knee than exhaust all the bones and ligaments and do total knee now and go to a revision knee. I'll say 10 to 15 years, uh, that is one cohort. So I use it and I parade it, I advertise it as a bridging operation. Never lifetime for a younger guys. For a 70-year-old second cohort, I'll say, boss, this is the best surgery the least morbid and least complications. That's what I go about it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Uh, Ramik, any thought process of uh, partial knee? Actually, I'm very comfortable doing a partial knee. And given a okay. choice, hmm. I always first advise a partial knee. Yeah, have you done Oxford's or only you have done fixed bearing? Oxford. Oxford. And now I'm coming to fixed bearing with the, my robotics. Did, did you find any difference between those two or you're happy with any of them? I'm very happy with them. And yeah. My Oxford was very, I was very comfortable with Oxford and probably the reason is how you put, actually put it. Oxford is a mobile bearing knee. Yeah. And as was discussed in the morning, we have to look at our dislocations. If you're good fit, then yeah, I don't think so. technique, very, very well thought out. For youngsters, Again. actually it's very reproducible and it's very forgiving, yeah. if I can use that word. For the youngsters, if you don't have robot, still you want the partial. There is a beautiful knee called Oxford knee from Zimmer. And just learning curve is slightly longer, but you go to the people who do that routinely, 
and they got a beautiful instrumentation, and you can do it without robot. Am I right? Yeah. Am I? yeah, yeah okay. Right. But the yeah. paradox yeah. is that the Oxford guys are yeah. looking. The paradox is that the Oxford guys are looking at robotics. Robot, yeah, I know. For <laughs> as <laughs> so they're, they're coming out with Rosa. They're coming out with Rosa software for uh, Oxford, Oxford as well. Oxford. So somewhere they have realized the importance of uh, uh, value add for robotics, even in Persian. Even the Oxford guys. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Right. Yeah. I need now to make a move. I get a flight to catch. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Have right. A good coming one. to the <laughs> most delicate point, Anup. I say that. Uh, you have taken the robot more for the marketing than for the value. Well, I, if you take my word for it, I have never advertised for it. I have never put any ad in the paper, nothing, no nothing. And I've got two of them. I've got Cori and I've got QS. I do it for my passion. I do it for patient benefit. And as patients get better, as patients' outcomes improve, naturally more patients flow in. But yeah. I think gradually it will become marketing neutral because a lot of hospitals in a city would have it. So marketing and costs gradually, Guruva will go out of context. Really thing is what you can do with the robotics, how well you can improve patient outcomes, that's the real key issue. Yeah, again, Anup has touched a very sensitive point. There is one thing, buying a robot for the sake of marketing and putting an advertisement, big hoardings, and uh, putting a, uh, what you call it, wet towels on the robot without doing the robot is a one aspect doing a robot properly and uh, adding value to that. But having said that, there is one thing called halo effect. Without we realizing, the people keep on talking about the robots. That's what exactly happens in each place. Hyderabad, we were the first one to get the robot. Now there are 15 robots. Every hospital acquires one. They, don't, they can't hold back. And that nullifies whatever the advantage of the one there, the, so the halo effect. What is the things which you want more from the robot in the future? If they come, companies come and ask, come on, what else do we want to do? So, I still believe that uh, it's an evolving technology mm. and uh, we haven't reached the final thing. Uh, I agree with Dr. Vijay that the robotic system should be open system. Open. Because yeah. we are trying to give a proper anatomical match to the patient. But the implants are not like that, okay? So there's a mismatch between the medial lateral and the anteroposterior thing. Now, if we have an open system, and if we plan a patient's, <coughs> if we plan, if we see a patient's knee morphology, and if we have the data of all the implants available, then perhaps we can give that patient the exact implant which can match his profile. So if we have an open system, then uh, that will work uh, much better. Raju. CT and uh, this technology can be used on plane radiographs. So you mean to say imageless robot you want? No, no. Image of radiograph can be used uh, for evaluation and planning. No. Then, then that, that again reduces the accuracy and the things which you want to do precisely. Narayan, what, what else you expect or what else you want to have in future robotics? Um, a lot of things, I think. Well, one of the thing is uh, the cost. I think you know that's where most of the people are not able to afford in this yeah, country. Let me just try to answer, uh, ask you why it is so costly. I think there's a lot of research involved, and also it's imported. And other things is that you know the usage is very less at the moment. And I think you know as the usage is going to go more and more in the future, I think you know it's going to become cheaper, like the navigation which has happened in the past. That's one thing. And the second, uh, the part of it is. The, the cumbersome operation of the, the robotics, I think, you know, that should become much and much simpler. And then I think, you know, then the people are going to use it more and more. For example, for the people who have already used navigation for many cases, they adopt the technology very quickly. One of the criticism is the longer duration, the, you know, the time taken for the surgery, the tourniquet time, etc. That's why the, some, one of the, you know, the panelists has just told he didn't like in the beginning, he has seen them. And I think, you know, the, the cumbersome operation of these uh, things have to become much and much simpler. And also, I think the, the robotics have to evolve more and more as the evidence comes in the future, both in terms of the, the mechanical, you know, all these axes and all other things, and also the longevity of the implant. For example, if all the 
process which are used all over the world become a registry, for example, and what do they have, what happens to those joints after four years, five years, and then, you know, if possible, that has to be incorporated into the, the system. I think, you know, it's an evolving science. It has to evolve more in terms of science and result. I no. have a, a point to be raised as well, Guru. I mean, we are all talk, talking about improving robotic technology, but we also need to talk about <laughs> what implant are we putting in in that patient. Is that implant proven in joint replacement registries? Is that implant is being used in thousands of patients with excellent results, or are we just marrying a technology to put in any implant that we want? Yeah, that's the second, second valid point. Yeah. And the second thing is, Companies have under tremendous pressure to copy other robots. So they want to bring in a quick uni and launch a quick uni. They want to bring a quick hip software and launch a hip software. All of these are going to be a disaster. Yeah. So I think that we have to be aware of. Just because some one robot is performing a good uni, suddenly the other day you cannot use a new implant and a new system and put in that uni compartmental knee replacement. So I yeah. think implant is important. Uh, Dr. Gurma, can I add a point? Yeah, uh, wait. Yeah, one, uh, one thing which I wish robots could give us uh, is the predictive value of, like, I mean, if you have two flexion deformities, both 50, 60 degrees, one of them has huge osteophytes, another one does not have osteophytes. I wish there were a robot who could tell me that removal of this osteophyte yeah, will, accord algorithm. You, algorithm. Yeah, will accord you this much of extension yeah. space, removal of this much osteophyte from the tibia will accord this much of open medial space. Absolutely. That's what that is a guesswork as of now. With artificial intelligence and uh, big data and machine learning, robotics, I don't know whether we will be there in the next decade. Definitely robot what is seeing is the tip of iceberg. In the next decade, with combine all these things, there will be an algorithm, cut this osteophyte, go this like that, it will come printed before you go into operating theater. Marunal. Yeah, I just wanted to make the same point that uh, the robot should analyze the data and let start. the surgeon know in the future that, okay, in this kind of a deformity with this phenotype, you do this procedure or you do the, this step No, next. definitely. It's a matter of time because data is coming and machine learning is the next logical step. That's as simple as that. Right, Anup. Yeah, so I think in the next five years, we're going to see a lot of systems actually marry active and passive systems. So you can actually go to radiographs, it will yeah. pull up the radiographs and give you whatever angles you want. You Correct. can go to a CT, it will marry it to the CT and you can go to the MRI also yeah. and it will marry to the MRI. So whatever you need in that particular case, imaging base, yeah. that image will coordinate with that system. So yeah. that's, that's coming on. Correct. Another in thing which I like with the robotics is, especially for the youngsters, the level playing field is going to be there. Because now we say that we have done 1,000 knees, I'm more experienced than you. But if you got an access with the robot, you can do as good a knee like me the day one. Of course, it doesn't mean that you should not learn manual. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying, robot will give you that uh, ability and that confidence and that objective evidence that you are doing the right things there. So you can't go wrong with a robot. So a level playing field. So the experience will be nullified. I'm sure in the, with the with more and more robots come, there will be 100 Gurwara days, 100 Anup Juranis, and 100 Manoj Vadvas. No issues about that. So that is again another point which I would like to know. And again, the learning and teaching is very objective, and which is again another important point of this one. So any other burning questions from the people? Like morning, uh, one of the colleagues has asked, which robot is the best? <laughs> there are company guys standing in the back. <laughs> yeah. For your, uh, on your disposal, all the robots are there. Which yeah. one you will buy? Yeah, right, sir. Right now, I got two robots, two no, types no, no. of robots. Tell me one. I cannot Anwar, buy two. I'm telling you. The I process. cannot buy two. Tell me one. <laughs> right. See, I went, for, I went for Maco yeah. after doing five years of research and experience. Number one, it has got the longest... Uh, um, serving a platform and it has got the most published papers and number three it has got the software for the hips and we got a significant number of hips and after seeing the hips i am married to maco okay. at that time i don't think there is any other and robot also, uh, we have an implant which has got a 15 plus yeah. OD operating. another point the triathlon from the striker which is the longest serving and one of the best implants in the knee replacement uh, armamentarium so those sort of scientific things because Robo for marketing, you can buy a cheapest robo because Maco is the costliest robo at the time. 
But okay. I went further because of these reasons. Dr. Jorani? Yes. Which robo you will love by if all the robots are in your disposal? I, I, shall I ask him which is his aspirational robot? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, this is a serious, I'm a serious question. I am a student and I love learning. So my first robot was Kori, which is a passive system, bar based. So now I've taken Cubis also. And uh, I am sure next year I'll take Mako also. Nice. So, so the object is not to have three and say on the platform that I can use all three. The object is to learn all three technologies, be able to use them for the benefit of the patient. That's, so, that's so it. you have given the answer of why you have bought this. What were the reasons you bought this? To robots? learn. To learn. To learn. To no. myself be able to be a better surgeon okay. and to learn more and do better. Okay. For me, uh -huh. I have taken so, three now. I have so taken Mako, I have taken Cubis. I'm going to take no, no. Wellies from the depot. No, For I, me, the reason no, is... Yeah. Yeah. Today, tell me, because I have to buy. So tell me which one I should buy. <laughs> I will answer your <laughs> question. <laughs> that is the question. I yeah. want to know it from you. <laughs> Sir, I told you. So let I, me answer his question, Guruva, without uh -huh. naming names. <laughs> let me answer. Let me no, answer I, your question. I, I, yeah, please. I, have to be I will use a robot which allows me a single platform to do a total knee, total hip, and a partial knee yeah. using implants, which has been validated for 15 plus years, which will give me so, CT scan and accuracy but of um, reproducing the patient's anatomy. And uh, this is a very long answer. No, you got the answer. No, no. There's only one very long answer. Yes, sir. I, I will also me, say this. Only one what, only tell one. me the name. <laughs> what? Tell me the name. Why you that, are scared? That, what, what percentage of your practice is hips is, and partial knees? Tell me first. No, no, there, his, uh, his, this Please. is your homework to find out the name. From what I'm, description sir, I have I am, I, am, I am asking you, not me. You, you have to, uh, No, to sir, it will depend on what kind of practice you have. If you have a primary knee practice, the answer becomes different. If you have a hip and uni practice also, the answer is what Mahesh gave No, no, gave this you. is a diplomatic answer. Suppose, no, 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 this is let very me, diplomatic sir, answer. Let me be very people. clear. We sitting here on the podium, we cannot fight for or name any company or a product. It is we not fair, only, sir. We can only But you got the answer. answer. As Anup said, no, no, no. if you are a primary knee surgeon, you can go for anything. If you want a hip, there is only one company. That's right. So you make your judgment. That's Seker, it. That's Seker, Seker, that. you bought. Seker, because Seker is also kind of mine. So, oh. no problem. Don't get excited. <laughs> so much of heat there. So, so much of heat done. there. Seker, done it, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, I am sure when Ramnik decided about this session, it was for this thing only, yeah. <laughs> for the for the for the entertainment yeah, factor. Yeah. He okay? wanted the glass to break. Now, <laughs> now, 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 the the actual thing. The actual purpose of Robo was discussed in the second session, in the basic session, yeah. when it was discussed thoroughly that robotic is a tool in your hand. Yeah. Okay. The thing which it has changed is the perception how to do a knee replacement. It's not mechanical thing right now. Okay. Now all these things started after robotic, and all the systems which we are discussing allows you to do that. Let me summarize. Yeah. I am sorry, my question is not answered. No, I'm I'll disappointed. Answer it, sir. I'll answer it I'm in disappointed. Name, okay. Uh, let me summarize the end of the session. Guru, I have one, one thing. Yeah. No, no, yes, no. sir. Yeah. This is sir, there is no one answer. Guru, I have no <laughs> politics. My whole question goes across, and I'm pretty confused with expert panel sitting out here. If I would fall in love with a chick, which I have not fallen in, but you all fell in love, in love with the robotic surgery and the machine, why is it that every time you guys want to buy a different machine? If the machine is very good, it should yeah. have been. No, I no, let, 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 let me answer you, Manoj. Machine. Let me answer because I'm the ready to bread. See, it's like changing okay. No, sir, it's not like that. You see, he is buying it because he can afford it. See, I bought Mako to do the hips. That purpose is served. Now, coming to the knees, almost all the platforms are safe. I wanted to help the other companies who helped me in my evolution. As simple as that. Depi was there with me right from my childhood days. And Meryl was there with me for a long time. So I wanted to help them out by buying their robot. As simple, and I, another point, Suhas is here. We wanted to do a cross-robotic research and publish papers. We already published seven papers on Mako. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what I'm. But the, see, but suppose tomorrow another comes with a hip, I might look into that as well. Here, coming to the knee, almost all the platforms are the same. 
except automated, semi-automated. Guruva, I have a question. Yeah, please. The entire premise of going for robotic surgery evolution was 20% patients are dissatisfied. No, that is wrong again. There is no 20% done. This is actually in India. Okay. So, say a patient after robotic surgery is dissatisfied. Yeah. What is the answer? I'll send him to you. <laughs> okay. I'll write, okay. Let me answer. Let me answer. Let me, let me answer that. You see, sir, for the knee replacement, there is already a sealing effect. Okay. The biomaterials, the surgical technique, the rapid enhanced protocol, all these things have hit the ceiling effect. So to get whatever the 10%, we are now looking into so-called non-mechanical alignment, which might have some water into that, but it is still early time to say that. But early results or midterm results are definitely proving that non-mechanical alignment is definitely a thing to practice. No doubt about that. And that will take another 10 years probably to say in the like morning I said advocative phase. But definitely the objective evidence is there. The robot is helped us like that. Now we are doing 5 degrees virus in tibia. There's so no issues about that. And another important point for me is the first day surgical ICU, if I operate 15 patients, out of them 10 robotic, 5 non-robotic, without seeing their x-rays, I can tell who is the robotic, non-robotic. The first two days, the post-operative pain, Manoj, unbelievably different. I'm sure all the robotic guys will uh, agree with that because yeah. of the less soft tissue trauma. There's no doubt about that. The last question, then we'll close it. Naren, somebody wants to ask a question. Yeah. So. Because inflammatory markers, you don't replace the tibia. You don't release the soft tissue, uh, uh, go which is already proven by mass. No, no, <laughs> which is papers published. Hello. Yes, it's working. Sir, taking a lead what uh, you have discussed right now, I work in a medical college, and like me, uh, many people work in a government setup, and uh, I don't think in my lifetime I'll be able to, uh, through the government or whatever the means, will be able to purchase the robot. And there are around 500 medical colleges I doubt any uh, more than five or six have it, right? So, uh, and from the discussion, it looks like that satisfaction and happiness belongs to the rich people only, those who can afford a robotic surgery. And, uh, but we treat masses, uh, and uh, uh, well, now my request is that all big guys are sitting on the dais. Now, uh, uh, when we were doing conventional hip and knee, we went step ahead by navigation. And now, over navigation, we have robotic, right? Now, can you think of, you have got two robots, he has done 500, he has done 5,000, a rich people, right? Now, can you think of that? The wisdom you now you have created by navigation and robot over years, by doing so many cases. Now, can you make the masses uh, uh, wise? Yeah, that, that, exactly. that, that right. now if you do conventional, now, that, that, that now these are the things which we'd have, we sir, had been yeah. missing. Uh, you got a very good question, I'll answer that question. Yeah. No, no, no. Let me answer that. Okay. Yeah. You see, point number one, this is the last statement. Point number one, you don't need robotic at all for doing a proper knee uh, hip replacement. Number two, all the medical colleges, you can still make the patients happy. It is not the rich man's prerogative. Number two. Number three, by doing the robotics, these bunch of people, we are adding definitely more value to the manual knee replacement. We ourselves learned so much, like yes. Anup said. In yesterday, classical case, Suhas has myself had done the case, extra articular deformity, the medial side is so tight, we went for, without doing any osteotomy. In the normal day, we would have done the osteotomy because the medial side is not opening at all. But without robot, we cut the tibia into five degrees virus, and put the implant. That is the extra knowledge which we got out of the robotics. That what the morning also I told them. Even if you go at three degrees virus on the tibia, heavens are not going to fall. It is the ligament balance that matters most. That is the point we learned, which we are telling the people. That's all the things we are going to teach the people this one. Not to buy the robot, which robot to buy. Because this is a smart conclave, the robots are going to teach that. And another point is, you cannot escape the discussion on the robot for the next 100 years. Let me tell you. 
you cannot go to any conference without the robot, without the alignment. Because conferences, as I told you, to confuse you at higher level. Every five years, we select a topic to confuse you. First five years, Patella. <laughs> Second five years, Cruciate. And third five years, something else. Now the robot. <laughs> After this answer, we'll take another topic to confuse you. Guruva. Guruva. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, we have a uh, momentous uh, distribution, sir. Sir, Dr. Gurba, just two minutes, please, on the dais. Yeah, may I call upon Dr. Raju Veshe? Dr. Vikram Jain. Dr. Noob Jurani. Dr. Noob. Yeah. Friends, uh, thank you so much for this encour encouraging day one. We have a very short break before our dinner starts. So either just stay around, just stay around and probably we will have our musical night basically. Some of our orthopedic friends, they all have some hidden talents. This day, same venue, here only, in this hall itself. So all our, or some of our orthopedic friends, they have some hidden talents. Somebody wants to sing, somebody wants to dance for you, or somebody wants to just play some musical instrument. So they, all of them, the orchestra would be setting up, and then we all will rejoin after half an hour. Thank you so much.